So Michael, you're stepping in to yeah. the middle of an event. The glory has been amazing. It feels great. Here. Corey Russell came this morning and gut punched us. Yeah, y'all don't need me much. <laughs> and so we've had an amazing um, few days just to kind of catch you up on some of the things that we've talked about. And then we'll dive into specifically what I want to talk to you about is culture mm. within the church because I think it's just so important. But we talked about values and systems and, um, and how the right values accompanied with the right systems can actually pr create some amazing results. Mm -hmm. And my testimony personally was that's where I started. As a, as a pastor, I learned from a church that had great values and great systems, and we literally just mimicked exactly what they were doing, and it produced a lot of people coming to our church. Mm -hmm. But there was a component that was missing that I didn't find till far later, and it was the God component, it was the presence component, it was the spirit component that actually worked well with the values and systems. And so we, we've talked about the values and the systems and how important they are to have in the life of the church. But today we've been talking all about culture. And um, I know that that's a big, one of the reasons that we just, we wanted to hear your heart on culture is because I know how important that is to you. And at Jesus Image, I've been there. I remember my first Jesus Image event, and I told you this testimony. <laughs> yeah, I remember this testimony. <laughs> I went and um, there was a moment where you and others were praying for people and everybody was responding the same way, which Wasn't was... was that after a, an usher danced with you? On no, the I'm getting to that. That's, oh, okay. That was my moment. I, uh, everybody was falling and shaking and having babies and spiritual babies. There was literally a woman in front of me. <laughs> yeah, she was birthing something and I didn't birth anything. You know, I, I didn't feel anything. And so I was actually, because I've always wanted to have that experience. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have it. So um, I was actually being, being a little turd, going to the bathroom, having a moment with myself. And this giant man, uh, 350, maybe 400 pounds, yeah. uh, saw me. It's one of our, our, our students. Yeah. Yeah. He beelined at me. He grabbed me like a little rag doll and began to dance with me. I mean, my legs were flailing out and I'm just kind of letting him do it. You know, like what in the world? Like this couldn't get any more weird. And then he puts me down and he grabs my hand and we begin we, to we told him We told him you were Methodist. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. But the... The joy of the Lord, I'm, I'm telling you, that was a critical moment. he was moment. a first year, by the way. <laughs> first year student. So it takes a little time to normalize them in some ways. <laughs> so after dancing with that very large man, <laughs> uh, I experienced, I think, what was pretty important in, in your culture, which is joy. So all that to just say, um, we've been talking about cultural components. So in your opinion, what are some of the most important cultural components that you think to me to be present, not only to host God well, but to see a, a church thrive and grow? Yeah, that's a good question. First of all, Randy, thank you for having me. The whole global team, can we give it up for this team? Pastor Matt, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Can I just, uh, let me just pray real quick, because I want to get this right. It's so important. Uh, I, don't, I don't want my answers, I want the Lord. So Holy Spirit, we trust you. You're the one who is our wisdom and you know your plans for the church and, and you know there's no replacing a tangible encounter with you. So I ask that you would speak to us all this week. I've, I come hungry. I don't come as a speaker, I come hungry. And I ask in Jesus' name that you would give us your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, well, I think um, what I'd like to do tonight is tell my story. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but I pastor a church in Orlando called Jesus Image, and we, we, uh, we have mass meetings. Um, but we also have a ministry school and, and a church. And uh, 
my journey to get here has been eventful to say the least. And uh, my background is pretty unique when it would like, I'm, I'm probably the only former Greek Orthodox person in this room, I would imagine. Uh, there might be a few, okay. There's a whole row of you. <laughs> would you wave at me again? Are all of you, oh, oh, you. Oh, okay, you were all saying her, her, her. Okay, it's just us then, but I'll take them when I can get them. So in many ways, I, I understand, you know, your background, I, even though our backgrounds are very different. But um, I think the Lord, the Lord is drowning out the peripheral and wanting to center us again on Jesus. And your view of Jesus will ultimately frame your relationship with him. That will birth your value for him and therefore it'll birth the way you build. So if Jesus is part of, then that's how you build. You'll make him part of. If you see him in a limited manner, you'll build accordingly because we all build according to a pattern. Uh, Moses built according to the pattern the Lord showed him. And that only came by him getting away with God. So if you'd asked me what's the core pillar of, of our environment, it would be the manifest presence of Jesus, period. And for us, there is no scalpel thin enough to divide Jesus himself and his presence. He is his presence. And that is a game changer because uh, in our circles, we'll say, I feel the presence of the Lord. I'm not sure we realize we're actually saying, I feel the Lord himself. And if I feel the Lord himself, that should change everything. So that's how, at least for me, uh, I've had you might even ask me this. I don't know. It wouldn't shock me if you do, but people say, can you come in and teach us how to flow in the spirit? And for me, it's not that ethereal. It's me holding hands with the Lord and trying to give him what he wants moment after moment. And, and the further you go into that experience with him, the greater the fear of the Lord becomes because uh, you realize your dependency and your weakness. And I, you know, Randy mentioned, I just had a major vocal surgery. Um, I couldn't really talk for four months. Randy actually came and preached for us. And that was a real struggle for me. I was, I was hoping to get healed, not in Randy's meeting. I, I couldn't even show up for that. But for those four months, I was, it was a rough time. And there are many people who had my condition that never preached again. So, thankfully, I feel weaker than prior to that experience. Thankfully, I, I feel less convinced of my own ability. Um, I, I feel like he gave me a limp through the process and it's a limp I don't wanna lose with my own ambition. Uh, does this make sense? I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it didn't make sense when I was 30. <laughs> but while I was gone, the church doubled in size. And <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay. You know. So in one way, that was encouraging. That meant maybe more golf in the future. But had I not seen the beauty and I think this is the key. Had I not seen the beauty of the Lord who builds the house, then it could have been a really insecure time for me. So, I don't even think, well, I don't, I know for a fact as I study the scriptures, and it's Randy's fault that I've been studying theology now for the last two and a half years. He told me to do it in, our, in my car. I was driving him to, preach in that little church when we first started, Randy, at this little Presbyterian church named St. Andrews, which is the home of golf. I was shocked the Presbyterians let us in, and they did. Thank God. Not for long. We eventually asked us to leave. <laughs> but 
they let us in and I honor them for it, but um, you simply cannot look at the scriptures and say Jesus is center because he's all in all. He fills everything. So to say he's center, I know what we're saying, but he's not just the center. He's the corner, he's the front. He's the great expanse in between the two. And if he's really Alpha and Omega, that means he's everything. And that being said, he's the builder and the substance that he builds with. Which basically leaves us as, and that's how God gets most glory. He's not looking for superheroes. He's just looking for partners who keep the crown on his head. Uh, Michael Miller, a dear friend of mine who pastors Upper Room, he said, he said, I love that your house, this house keeps the crown on Jesus' head. And that's not the most theological, so theologically beautiful thing to say, but I know what he's trying to say. It's a, there's only one superhero and his name's Jesus. And that's what he's looking for. It's people who look to him, depend on him, talk to him, sing to him, talk about him. There's really no use in changing the subject because it is, the Lamb of God is the Father's only sermon. And Jesus is heaven's only topic. So if heaven is going to come to earth, which is what we all pray, we need to get used to beholding the lamb. And uh, I hope that answered your question. I probably could answer it in one word, Jesus, but that's our core foundation. I don't, because I've tried the other way, you know, and it's taxing. It destroys families. It wears people out. You build an idol unto yourself. You, you spend your whole life turning your wheels, thinking God's happy. And then you get to the throne and realize it was wood, hay, and stubble. I mean, who wants that, you know? So you may as well ask another question because I'm going to stay on it all day long. But, yeah. <laughs> well, you said something this minute ago I want to go back to because I think it's really important. Um, while you were gone, your church doubled, mm -hmm. which... <laughs> probably is challenging in some ways, but it's really encouraging to know yeah. that what was built, and I know you're not going to take complete credit for it because Christ empowered you to do it, but what was built was centered around him. Yeah, The people were coming for him. Mm -hmm. The people were serving for him. It was all about him. Mm -hmm. So since that's fresh on your mind, why don't you tell us some other things that you learned in that season? Because I think there's a lot of pastors that are going through things. It may not be vocal, sure, but it's something. And so what are some things that God revealed to you during that season that you just like, I, I never want it. You said something about, you may not want to talk about the limp, but what is something that God showed you that you don't want to forget? The Lord showed me I committed this, the great sin, the Bible calls it, of presumption. And I had to have a very extended time of repentance before the Lord because I was traveling everywhere preaching and the devil didn't give me vocal polyps. I gave me vocal polyps. And when I first started, nobody wanted to have me. I mean, uh, when Jesus image started, my in-laws, for those who don't know, my father-in-law is Benny Hinn and they had walked through a divorce. So it was very public and that was the year Jesus image launched. So my friends called and they're like, dude, we love you, but we can't have you. This thing's too public. Your father-in-law, he's super interesting. The way he dresses, they walk. I mean, we don't know what to do with him. You're a little more laid back. We love you, but we're gonna have to distance ourselves from everyone. So I was relegated to like, I preached women's aglow meetings and like, <laughs> does anyone know what a Marie Callender restaurant is? I, I preached in those. One time they didn't have money for an honorarium. They gave me a pie. <laughs> and I, and I, eat, I eat low carb. So I'm like, what am I gonna do with this? And you know, I preached their Christmas banquet. It was just white circle perms, the whole crowd. It just looked like the same thing, all gray perms. And so that's how, I mean, I started on the street. I, any, nobody would really have me, but, but Joy Dawson who helped start uh, really was one of the founding voices of, of YWAM, along with Lauren and Darlene Cunningham. She, she took me under her wing in my early days, and she taught me to wait on the Lord to get direction and to never say I would go preach somewhere unless the Lord gave me the green light. 
And that's really easy when you get like an invitation every two months. I was like, sure, now I've got 60 days to fast and pray about one invitation. And then the Lord started moving and miracles started. And I had a fresh baptism in the Holy Spirit while visiting a Lutheran church in Connecticut. I had fasted and prayed for two years. And October 23rd, 2007, the heavens opened over me and I got born again, again. And everything I dreamed of started happening in seconds. And then the ministry, really Jesus image in some ways was birthed that night in a man's church who's a theologian, a Lutheran theologian who was crippled, who three years prior had gotten healed in my father-in-law's meeting and I didn't know. And I was the one catching him when he got healed. He showed me the video that night. We didn't know. He goes, is that you on the video? I go, that's me. What am I doing in your church? He goes, I don't know. So when that, when that happened, people started reaching out and then life got busier. And I would say I did pretty well for, uh, gosh, 12 years. But then when the church started and I started making these covenant relationships with people that I treasure, and then we launched the send and then our events had taken off. And then, you know, a lot of those guys became my dear friends and fathers in the faith became dear friends to me. And the moment they called, I responded, which felt like honor. You know, it felt like doing the right thing as, as a Greek foundationally, you're a very tribal people and you, 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 you're with people to the end and you do whatever they need. And I just over preached and went places I probably shouldn't have and God still moved. But the Lord spoke to me when I couldn't talk, which <laughs> he was like, man, I'm waiting 12 years to talk to you. And finally, uh, he said, you've been a wonderful friend to my servants, but I miss our friendship. And to put it in context, I was still, and I'm not trying to, you know, toot my own horn, but I was still doing, you know, at least two hours with God in the morning, at least a whole day a week where I'm with Jesus, fasting consistently, you know, multiple 40 day fasts a year. But I, that dependency had weakened as to you tell me where to go and I'll go. Because the standard is so high. The standard is Jesus who didn't do anything he didn't see the father do and didn't say anything he didn't hear him say. That's a high standard. Nonetheless, he's, our, he's the patterned son. And when I heard that, it rocked me. And um, I learned that that I'm his servant and that he missed me, missed that part of me and that he wanted to be my only satisfaction. Additionally, I learned I have the most amazing wife who preached the paint off the room at church and the miracle started breaking out and I'd be watching on live stream or sometimes I'd be on the front row and I couldn't talk and I was wanting to calm her down because she gets really, she gets really excited. <laughs> Where did she get that? Who knows? <laughs> My team is incredible. Um, we don't, uh, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not uh, projecting this on anyone here. So I can only tell you what God has directed us to do at Jesus Image and how to build, but we've never had a meeting on what will happen in the service prior. Our team gathers for at least an hour to seek the Lord before service, every service. And so we don't have flow charts back there, but there are tears in the carpet. And yeah, it's, uh, I learned that I'm accountable for a lot. I have wonderful people that I work with and in some ways I'm responsible for their breakthrough in God and I'll answer at the throne and it was really sobering. So I would say those three things. That's good. Yeah. We're super glad that you're back. Thank you. Yeah, super it's good. Glad. People are like, it's good to hear your voice. I'm like, it's good to hear my own voice. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. It's good to see you're getting stronger. 
Yeah, yeah, I feel good. I'm about 70%. I just, okay. you know, I used to get really into it and I still do, but my voice won't connect with. Yeah. And then a beautiful thing happens. You have to trust the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Not your volume. And uh, that's much better. I understand. Yeah, yeah. So one thing I've always wanted to ask you, this is kind of, we're just shotgunning here. Yeah, sure. But when the Lord called you to ministry, it didn't take on the form of normal church, obviously. You do have a church now Mm -hmm. uh, that meets on Sundays. Uh, So it it took on a completely different form. It it started, I'm assuming it started with a core group of people. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, because one of the things that we've been talking about is, you know, we all have different callings here in, in what we would call traditional Protestant church, get a launch team, mm-hmm. go through the process, advertise, send out marketing, you know, launch a church. It may <laughs> not be trouble. for everyone. Yeah. And so won't, won't you tell people a little bit about your process of, of launching ministry and what that looked like? So um, I, it, you know, I have a background in golf. So that's what I did professionally and played for the Florida Gators and coached their team. So in athletics, I hope I don't make people mad here. We're not in Ohio, right? No, we've we're already in Pennsylvania. Done that. All day, we've done that. Okay. Well, it's like the Jordan LeBron debate, you know? <laughs> it's rings matter. They do. Rings matter. And uh, at the end of the day, that's what matters. And the church needs to reestablish the win. What is it all about? And then work in reverse. And the church needs to allow the scriptures to determine the win, not the latest, greatest church planting movement. That's where you get in trouble. Because everyone, like if you went to a church planting conference in America and you told, your buddy told you, we started with 1,500 people. Well, a lot of places would be like, you're amazingly successful. If you wanted to use that standard, which is the wrong one, by the way, because the scriptures don't major on that. They just don't. The scriptures do mention numbers, but they are not the preeminent focus of the text. The preeminent focus of the text is this is Jesus Christ, period, from Genesis to Revelation. That's the only way to look at the Bible. It's the only way the fathers of the church read the Bible. It's the way Jesus himself read the Bible when he taught it. Luke 24, they're on the road to Emmaus. He begins with his death, burial, and resurrection through the Old Testament scriptures. That's his starting point. So if the resurrected Christ conducts a Bible study that way, we should do the same. If he's expressing value, that should be our value. We don't get to change the, the, the value of his own heart. So... Let's just say you did start with 1,500 people. You might feel really good about yourself, like really amazing, what I'm doing is working. But all of a sudden you discover that Joel Osteen had 1,000 babies in his nursery when they opened their new building. 1,000 babies, which requires 250 children's workers. So now you're just sort of successful. And then Joel started with 35,000 people that day. Now you're really not successful. But all of a sudden, Joel might just feel phenomenal until he bumps into a church in Lagos, which exists, that has a million seats in the ground just for Sunday church. So at that point, Joel isn't even a Marie Callender. Now, I don't have a problem. Well, I do have a problem with it. I'm just going to be honest. I do, because it destroys people. And I've been on the inside. And I've lived in a church that God lived in. I grew up in my father-in-law's church. For 20 years, God lived with us. So the glory is the standard, period. And there is a way to have him. And there is a way to keep him. Martha knew how to get him in the door, but Mary knew how to keep him in the house. (laughs) And the church doesn't, foundationally, I'm just talking about, I'm getting down to the foundation here. The church does not exist foundationally for people. 
the church is a people that exists for Jesus. And that's how you get people by accident. They just come. And then once they come, you didn't, you didn't have to waste time with your staff and spend every staff meeting trying to figure out a new marketing scheme. If you're gonna do marketing, that's fine, but you better have the glory. And so my nature is to be super singularly focused. One vision, one focus. Ralph Wilkerson and Rex Humbard, uh, I, I don't know, R Ralph Wilkerson pastored a church called Melody Land. He was a very pastoral influence to Catherine Kuhlman. Rex Humbard, actually Ralph's wife and Rex's wife played organ for Miss Kuhlman. And Rex, who pastored right here in Akron, Ohio, pastored the Cathedral of Tomorrow, I believe. That was the name of it. He was a dear friend of mine. His wife, Maud Amy, was like this with Catherine, and he gave Catherine her first tent that seated 6,000 and 18,000 showed up the first night. 18,000, before social media, before any of that. Do you know what she had? God. God. So there's a lot of places you can go that are gonna teach you like data migration, how to do this, how to do that. Fine, but we are all wasting our time unless we as leaders go into the room and shut the door until we find him. Because all you're doing is begging people to come to a place that's not a church. And I said that on purpose because the building is not the distinguishing factor as to whether or not it is a church. I mean, you can turn a 7-Eleven into a church and that happens when Jesus walks in. And that's what the scriptures teach. If two or three gather in my name, I am there even in the midst of them. So I think the proper way to look at it, because culture does matter, organization matters, uh, excellence matters, discipleship matters. There's a right way to do things, but it has to be viewed as wine skin. And like Bill says, Bill says the wine skin must serve the wine, not vice versa. That's what's happened in America is the clock, not, and, and I know we need one today, I get that. But I'm talking about culturally, nationwide, worldwide in the West. The clock, you would think, died on the cross. And if you've, and we've started to believe like the dumbest stuff, stuff that sounds wise, but it's not scriptural. Like, you know, like uh, these church planner guys looked at my buddy, Michael Miller, and uh, they go, you know, studies show. Studies. studies show. I'm like, oh God, is this a biblical study? Well, no, no, studies show that people don't like to sing more than 27 minutes. And then, I, now, had I been at that table, Miller just started to cry. He wept. And he wept because. Jesus probably weeps at such statements because we sing forever in heaven. I like heaven. Yeah. <laughs> 20, and then I guess the question is, who cares what studies say? The people should not determine the food they receive. That's not how I was raised. My mom put the food on the table and you ate it. But what we need, listen, what we need are leaders who've lost the fear of man, who would rather die than be without Jesus. And then leaders understanding through the scriptures, the proper ingredients that cause a building to become the house of, of God or the people to become the house of God. And it's possible. And then once you get that, your team can actually go on dates as married couples rather than spinning their wheels trying to figure out how to get 60 more people in the building or launch a new group. Groups are fine, we have them. But there are groups that are missional. There are groups that bring them closer to Jesus. Like we don't have a shuffleboarding group or a, you know, like the point is, is we wear ourselves out as Isaiah wrote, thou hast wearied yourself with the multiplicity of your ways. 
And the most free pastors are the most simple. You know, like somebody asked me once, you'll love this. They said, some leaders from a church growth movement came in. They're like, "Um, do y'all sing this long every Sunday? (laughs) And we said, yeah. Yeah, they're like, and do you, do you preach until you feel like God is done every Sunday? I said, yeah. And then, and then <laughs> he looked at me, he said, what happens if they leave? The pe-? I said, who? He said, the people. I said, I don't know. I guess they go home or go out to dinner. I never thought of it. I've never thought of that. And they said, well, how do you find balance? And I said, uh, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, how do you balance? And, and they have trouble defining it, but it's like, how do you balance balance with the Lord? And my response was, what is so balanced about Jesus? Is his love balanced or is it furious? Is it unconditional? Is the Calvary balanced? What is it about the vision of Calvary that is 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 uh, is uh, sanitized. I, if you've ever seen the devil, as you mentioned earlier, it was so powerful, by the way. If you've ever seen a devil come out of someone legitimately, not all don't have to be like the exorcist movie, but I grew up watching this weekly. I never left as a 12-year-old kid going, that was the most balanced exorcism I've ever seen. <laughs> it's really it was just right. It was just perfect. You know, it was just, it was just, that devil came out in just such a beautiful way. And it came out in a way that would not offend anyone. You know, I've probably seen thousands of people jump out of wheelchairs. I've seen a lady carry a tumor in her hand to the platform. Uh, The face of Jesus appeared on the wall of our church for six weeks, looked just like our logo. When I was a little boy, and people flew in from around the world. There's nothing balanced about that, but it was glorious. Walking on water isn't balanced. Multiplying food is not balanced. That whole thing, what we should call it is the fear of man. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. But, but, you know, I'm all about the house of prayer. I think, I don't mean Mike Bickle, he's a dear friend, but I mean the concept. But before we gain an understanding on his house being a house of prayer, we have to realize it's his house. He said, my house, my house, I own it, I bought it with my own blood, it's mine. You get to live there too, but you're leasing it. It's my house. That first and foremost as a pastor is probably one of the most important things you could ever learn. And so, so one of the people are like, uh, one of the leaders was like, you, the, the, the singing, how do, you, how do you get away with that? And I said, sir, have you noticed the lyrics of what we sing? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, there's not a single congregation member listed in a single lyric. We're not singing to the people. We are singing to Jesus. The people are not on our mind when we're worshiping. If anything is on your mind other than God, when you think you're worshiping, you're not worshiping. You're singing. And that's, that's how you get to these deep places. So I don't even know what you asked me, but I hope this is helping. But we, we have to look, and I didn't bring, I, I'm not one of those preachers who uses an iPad all the time, but this was easier. My bags were pretty full because I have to carry these in-ears and all that now. But we need to allow the Bible, the Bible, the word of the living God, to determine the pattern and how we build. If we do that, he will come. God only fills the house that he designed. I'm not talking about anointing and gifting here. That's important. I'm talking about something deeper, a habitation. Exodus 25, create for me a house so that I can come, create for me a dwelling that I might come and dwell with you. That's his desire. That's why God comes down. Now, every system, the culture should serve that. I'm not saying throw that out. But I am saying this. This is what I'm saying. If he didn't come, it wasn't a good meeting. 
and there's a way in. It's measurable. Yeah. Things change. Things react. The air reacts because he's the king. The Bible says the place that they prayed was shaken in the book of Acts. Not the walls, the place. The entirety of the place, the people's ribs, their garments, their eyebrows, their unibrows, their mullets, everything. Everything reacts when Jesus comes in a room. And pastors more than anyone should know whether he was there or not. And if he wasn't there, go in your room and close the door. Pay whatever price you have to pay to become a flammable agent of the Holy Spirit for a people. Like, like, I'm sure people have heard this before, but then I'll shut up. But you get me going on this, man. It's your fault for inviting me. Yeah. Chris Valentin asked the Lord, why did God choose Reading? And the Lord said, I didn't choose Reading. I mean, if you've ever been to Reading, I know it has amazing prophetic words over it, that it's going to be the next Riviera of, the, of like Europe. But if you've been to Reading, you're like, God, why did you come here? My Lord. <laughs> and I live there. The, the Lord said, I didn't pick Reading. I picked Bill. And as much as we talk, and it's, it's my heart too, to build a, pe- build a people in God's presence, at the end of the day, God can take an individual and light up a nation with him or her. They just can't throw in the towel. Eventually, you have to get tired of seeing the crippled leave cripple. You have to get tired of preaching your guts out and not seeing a flow of souls. And even if you are, Even if you are, you still have to allow the text to be the standard so that it calls you higher and higher and higher and higher so that you're continually dying this death. And the people will come to do it the other way. Imagine doing it the other way, which is really the arm of the flesh. To do it the other way might look good, but at the throne, only what he builds will make it through holy fire. Now, Reinhardt used to say, teach me to mind now what will matter in the end. That's what God's looking for in pastors, I believe. And of course, we need to love people. Of course. But we love people best when we're most in love with Jesus. That's good. So the, um, I believe that most, if not all, of the pastors and leaders here are yes and amen and on board Mm. with that. Mm -hmm. Like, more than anything... This is, we are talking about church growth. This, this mm-hmm. is a, Wim, the, the Wimber started this. Mm-hmm. Dr. Clark obviously touched very powerfully by God mm-hmm. through that movement. And we want to honor the heart's desire, not only to see people in love with Jesus, but to see as many people as possible come to Jesus. Sure. So that growth is, I think mm-hmm. in this context, in this crowd, the growth desire is pure. Mm-hmm. Like we want Jesus in our buildings. We want Jesus in our meetings. We want Jesus in our life. And we want everybody to know him. Mm-hmm. And, but I think that especially in North America, there's so, many, there's so many different models and there's so many different ways to do that. Mm-hmm. And so the question that I asked about oh, the schools how do we spe- start? specifically yeah. Is did God give you a strategic plan? Like, Michael, I first want you to yes. start with the school. There's going to be a church eventually. You didn't pack yeah. all yeah, of sorry, it. Sorry, I missed your whole question before. You no, it's fine. Second time. I was going to come yeah. back to it. I wasn't going to let you off the hook. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> was it step by step? Or did you see a fuller picture that he gave you strategy for? Yeah. I was driving in Reading um, down Eureka Highway. We had taken a year off. My wife had a heart arrhythmia and insomnia. And for about eight years, or five years, she slept about an hour and a half to two hours a night. And she was hospitalized twice. She had to wear one of those vests that monitor your heart. And I called Joy Dawson, and Joy said, there's only one place to go. Go to that Holy Spirit hospital up there in Reading. So I called Bill. Bill had just had a stomach surgery, an intestinal surgery, and I felt bad calling him, but I knew it was the Lord. And he said, well, how soon can you come out for a visit? And the visit just turned into us moving. So I was driving. I didn't, let, let me say this, because I think this set it up. I didn't, I didn't go there to preach. Right. Uh, in the beginning, I waited in line with everyone until Bill found out and got mad. He's like, you're not waiting in line anymore. Come sit up here. But we did it all. We, just, we, didn't, we weren't there for ulterior reasons. 
You know, some people go to events to further their ministries, meet people, find good staff, steal people's staff, all, you name it, we, we, people do it. So I was just there because I wanted the Lord and my wife needed a breakthrough. And uh, about four months in, I was driving down Eureka Highway and I had a moment with God where this revelation just landed. Go back to Orlando, start a school, give away what, what I've given you, expose the people to the people I've exposed you to. Give them consistently what's been taking place in your events. And so I did, and 72 people signed up. And, oh my God. Uh, two weeks in, I was reading Acts chapter two, and it was like a bomb hit the room, just reading it. And I started seeing manifestations that even I were challenging me. I, some were so intense, I was like, is that a demon or the Lord? And now after walking with those people, I can tell you which ones were, de were devils and which ones <laughs> were the Lord. But, so I noticed in the school context that we would teach them uh, the word, our value system, and then they were going to other churches and coming back and kind of refuting what they were getting at Jesus school. And I knew the Lord, I knew what he was saying. You need to start church. And I resisted it. I'm like, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm an evangelist who has a school and I just don't want to do a church. The thought of being with the same people every week. My parents were pastors. My wife's family, they were pastors. So I just thought, I'm not doing that. And, but I will start a Sunday night gathering. It's always the process for pastors. Yeah. So here's what I said. I said, okay. The Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to gather people and from now on, at Jesus School and the ministry, or and the, and the, which was called Jesus Nights at the time, you are never to tell them who's coming to preach or lead worship until I take you home. And if your kids do it after I take you home, you can come back as a cloud of witness encounter and go after them. No, he didn't say that part, but, <laughs> but I, I, that's how much of a core value it is for us. The reason is, I had this dream in my heart that if it could truly be about Jesus, it wouldn't expire with me. Because at the end of the day, I mean, I just think the church is overly marketed to right now. I mean, I can't even get on Instagram anymore without seeing a new flyer with a new event and 20 faces on it. And when you're building that way, you're like, well, what happens when that person's not really in anymore? You know, it seems like there's a 10 year cycle on worship movements. So what happens when they're out and I have to make friends with the new ones and get them in? So we, we just blew that whole thing up. And I told the team, we're gonna do like one or two posts. And the post will say this, on September 16th, which was my birthday, we didn't even plan it. We will gather, that was a Sunday night. The next, the next line said, we will worship, period. And he will come, period. So I told our team, just get a room that seats like 70 people. And they're like, are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm positive because nobody's gonna come. There's just no way. We're not, we're not, you know, getting the word out like we should. And, but something in me had died, Matt. It was like, I so wanted him because I tasted him. So I, if you've not been in his glory, it's so hard to even relate, but there's a place in his glory where you don't ever want to go back. Watching him do it and watching him move is so, it's what you dream and live for. And the thought of doing it another way, it just feels like you backslid it. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's true. So it's my, my, my assistant or one of my, Staff members at the time said, why don't we get a little bigger than 72 or 70 people? So they got one that's at 300 and 400 people came. And I pulled up and there was an overflow and I'm like, how did they, they get here, you know, what's going on? So we had a great meeting and then um, 
I thought the next week they wouldn't come back. And they did. And it's been three years and, you know, they keep coming. That's how we started. But I think... So we have the revealed will of God, which is in the scriptures. And then we have this mysterious hidden will of God that can be more individualized where there are like these covenants within covenants that God makes with us. And we made those with him. And that we will we'll fight for purity at, with, at that level. And we knew we were protecting a baby. And when you have a newborn and you don't protect it, they die. And we knew the early days were really important. So our no became as powerful as our yes. You know, like one guy, a super famous worship movement, one of their worship leaders, was coming to one of our gatherings and started to make super like bougie prima donna requests. So if you do that to our team, they go, that doesn't sound like Jesus. So like the red light starts flashing. And then they were like, well, we need this many people to travel with us. And so you have to understand, we grew up in this. So we're like, wait, explain to me why you need those people. And the reasons were really bad. Let's put it that way. So my wife's like, you're going home. And the manager was like, you can't do that to so-and-so. She goes, I just did. You're going home. And it wasn't to prove a point like, it wasn't this personal beef. It was, we're fighting for purity. And it's costly. You know, like you'll never get from me if you have me come preach what you have, you're never gonna hear from me how much you're gonna pay me. I come in faith, like Jesus told me to come. And what we can do is allow the ministry results to justify our compromise. The Lord told me, if, if you'll focus on purity, I'll focus on growth. So it's like, I, I'm sure you never went to one of these in college, but where I went to college, we had these things called keg parties. Never heard of it. Yeah, I'm sure you never heard of one of those. Never heard of so, it. So, okay. <laughs> Pretend you had kegs filled with water. All right, which you probably wouldn't have showed up to in college. Uh, yeah, never heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, imagine each church is like a vat of water. Let's call it a vat instead of a keg. Vat's better. Vat, vat's more biblical. All right. If you had 10 and nine were sour and bitter water because of mixture. If the 10th was pure and flowing, you'd have to keep the people out of line. And it is possible to build a house, not that's perfect, but on the purity of Jesus. And so that's what we did is the school really became, anyways, we gathered, my father-in-law came in, without telling me and announced it as a church. Uh, he launched it without telling me and I was on the front row. So I had him as a guest speaker and he goes, this is now a church, I establish it in Jesus' name. And I'm like, <laughs> you know. So I was mad, I was mad. Cause I was like, whoa, you can't do that. It's not even your church. But you know, in our culture, like he told me once, he's like, your kids really aren't your kids, they're my kids. And I go, oh, really? He goes, I said, explain that to me. He goes, the Bible doesn't call them the grandchildren of Abraham. The Bible calls them the children of Abraham. He's like, they're all mine. So he just walked in, you know, he's like, this is a church in Jesus' name. So at, at which point, at which point, another preacher walked in who'd flown in from England to go home. He lives in Orlando. He was in his pajamas. And the Lord said, get out of bed, put your clothes on, get over to Jesus' image and just sit there. And I really think the Lord sent a few servants of God that night, genuine servants of God, to establish it with two to three witnesses. That's how the church was officially birthed. Pastors got mad at me, but I didn't even launch it. I was like, dude, I'm not even involved in it. 
So. It was an accidental launching. Yeah. And, um, but what I can say is that, so it went from the school to that, and the whole uh, culture shifted within our community now because now we're not an, a ministry that has events or that an events-driven ministry that has a school and a church on, a, on the side. I feel like we found a, a very biblical itinerary in God, which is we are, we are a local church who puts on events that are our outreach, our evangelistic arm, and our SEAL Team 6 discipleship school is Jesus School. And so I feel like we found a, a more blessed pattern. Yeah. Amen. That's the story. That's With a good. lot of pain in between. So. Well, that's good to know. I, I mean, and I'm, I've always wondered that. Because mm-hmm. um, we, we see, you know, we, we pay attention as pastors and leaders, we pay attention to the places that God's in love with. Mm-hmm. And, you know, very quickly we can make even your personal revelation of how to do ministry totally. a pattern. Yeah, absolutely. And it should be everybody's. Absolutely. And I've talked to church planners who like, yeah, I think the way to do it now is not to get people and do it this way, but to start a school of ministry. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and now even what you did by revelation, God speaking to you has become a pattern because of the influence. And, yeah. and I know that I, all of that just to say, and what I wanted to hear was um, God gave you specific strategy for you, yeah. your people, your team, and he your did. city. And I'm really careful to not project that. Yeah. But I'm boldly projecting what the scriptures teach because there is this Leviathan in America that's built a church that's 20 billion miles wide and an inch deep. And we've got to change that. Yeah. Like the church should know what John chapter one says. The church should know the Beatitudes. Yeah. You, do you know what I mean? And if we yeah. don't, how in the world did that happen? The yeah. church should know the creeds, mm. the creeds of the church. Like, how did we get here? Yeah. Um, so for that stuff, I'm, I'm going. But as far as my specific assignment, it's not my job to say, you should do it like we did. Right. I'm happy to share it. But I did go to Bill that day because I was driving to go see him when, I, when the Lord spoke to me in my car. And uh, I pulled up and we were sitting at the table for dinner. And I said, Bill, I just got like a blueprint from God. And uh, he just looked at me. He goes, yeah, it's, uh, it's in the air here. <laughs> and I was like, that's the weirdest. But I get it now. I get it because when Jesus comes in his glory, your every dream rests within that cloud. You know, it's like if he's all in all, then your every need is right there. And you know, he's the X on the map. He's the treasure chest. He makes average people look like Avengers and (laughs) <laughs> I mean, could Catherine sing? I don't know if you've watched any of her old footage. She couldn't sing a lick. But God came. And I think also, oh, we've got like two minutes, but I think exposing yourself to, to those rare people really provokes you. You know, saintly people. Like the ones who who found him. And they ruin you. You're talking about getting near to him? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really important as pastors. It's probably one of the worst things a pastor could say is you don't need to go there because God can God's doing it. He can do it anywhere. He can, but he's not. And he's not for a reason. And he is doing it there for a reason. I wasn't like that. I mean, we drove three hours each way to my father-in-law's church as growing up. My mom drove me three hours each way for Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday. And we did that for years. I don't know where that would fit in church growth manuals. That's probably not the best way to grow your church. But he was there. Yeah. Well, I've heard um, Pastor Bill say many times, 
you go find revival. You chase revival until revival finds you. Mm -hmm. You know, and he talked about in the early days, just going to those places just to be in the environment mm -hmm. and around the people. Well, last time I was at Greater Things, I, when I landed in Oklahoma City, I, I had this weird sense. I felt the Lord say to me, you're not here just to preach. And something happens in my own life when I get around Randy and I had a prolific dream that included Mike Bickle and some other stuff. I ended up calling Mike right after Oklahoma City and it rocked Mike and God was speaking to us about our relationship. It's important to go where God is, you know, and God manifests him. See, oh, these stupid in-ears. I'm taking them off. My doctor's gonna get mad, but God manifests himself for a reason. When God reveals himself, God is unveiling himself. In those places, God is becoming vulnerable to a people he's learning to trust. Knowing that the closer he gets to you, the more you can hurt him. Judas, the Bible says it would, it would have been better that Judas were never born. Why Judas? Many stole from the Lord through the scriptures because of his proximity to Jesus. The proximity was the blessing and the proximity was the standard by which God would judge. Moses can't see the promised land. Why? God let him in the cloud. So when God, ex when God is disrobing himself of his mystery, that's what's happening when God manifests. He's, uh, he is lifting an element of mystery so that we can behold him. That's a big deal. I talked to Jeremy Riddle. He was weeping over fish tacos. We were talking about it. They sound good, don't they? I'll shut up, I'll shut up after this. But this is what Jeremy, we were talking. I said, Jeremy, you gotta tell me, what was it like to sing, let heaven come and a massive, golden cloud comes flying at your face for weeks. The worshiper in us or the worship leader would say, it must have been the set. Or it must have been Steph doing what she does, her tie bow on the ground, whatever she was. But Jeremy goes, it's not the set. It's not the song choices. It was the 30 years of decisions in the shadows that Bill and his team made, that the families made, the price paid to move from Weaverville, the offerings, the gifts, the sacrifice, and finally the dam broke. Yeah. And God said, I can trust you. Yeah. If that happens, it doesn't have to be a cloud, but if God is there, you go. And that's a sign not of fanaticism. It's a sign of humility. Yeah. yeah. And it's why people went to Toronto. Yeah. It's why people went to Brownsville. Mm -hmm. Because God is there. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Love you. Thank you. Love you. Love you. <laughs>